Hello, testing. Welcome to Photography Chat with Merlin. Photography Chat with Merlin. Oh, look. Those are the people who are watching, huh? Those are the people. Hi, everyone. Nice. Welcome to another episode of Photography Chat with Merlin. It's uh, Season 3, Episode 23. Whoa. And uh, I'm here in uh, Henry's uh, studio in uh, Vancouver. And uh, Henry is going to do a land acknowledgement here for us. Okay. We have just a little bit of land acknowledgement here. Uh, we want to welcome you to, this is the ancestral territory of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh people. That's where my studio is located, and uh, I thank, I'm grateful for uh, being here in this territory. And, and I'm, that's it. That's my acknowledgement. It's a terrific acknowledgement. Thank you. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, we're in Henry's studio here, and he's going to take us on a bit of a tour. Um, but do you want to take a moment to uh, let the people know a little bit about you? All right, God. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> a little guy. There's a lot to say, a lot to tell. Okay. A little camera. Oh, I'm on this camera up here, eh? Yeah. Where is that? Camera. Oh, it's over there. Yeah, it's okay. right there. All right. Uh, I think, are we, we look backwards or something, right? It is flipped around, I believe. No, well, actually, no, that's right. That's right. That's oh, it's flipped right. around when you have it, the camera the other way. So. Yeah, yeah, okay. Anyways, okay. Uh, I'm a uh, photographer, writer, sort of artist guy. Uh, and um, I've lived in Vancouver since, I was born in the States in 1946, and I've lived in Vancouver since 1970, with short stints in Montreal and Saskatoon, and, uh, and started doing photography in the 1960s, and at the time I lived in Berkeley, California, and there was a lot of shit coming down there. And I was in the middle of it all, and uh, when things got really too violent is when I came to Canada. And uh, my, uh, my family are, were from Canada already, so it was not a big deal for me to come and leave the violence behind. But then I discovered we had our own violence here in Canada, but uh, it was not as bad as in the U.S. where everything is based upon firearms. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, I was doing photography down in Berkeley, California, and I went to school at a place called Laney College that was a junior college, and they had a photography department, and... Uh, it was pretty cool because it was a it was a like a polytechnical school, and they had uh, on one side of uh, the photography department they taught people how to do dry cleaning, and uh, on the other side of the photography department they taught people how to do cosmetology, and so people would come in and they'd get their hair done, and their suit pressed. And then they would come into the photography department to get their portraits shot. So that was the kind of place that I learned how to do photography in. And it was in o Oakland, California. It was, a, it was a really cool place. It was, uh, it was uh, probably uh, three quarters of the people there, maybe half, were, were African Americans. So it was a very heavy... heavy uh, uh, presence of of uh, lots of 
you know, uh, political activity going on. And, uh, and plus being in Berkeley, there was, uh, it was quite, you know, it was actually beyond a few things going on. It was like everything was going on there. Anyways, came to Vancouver, 1970, and uh, I had been going to the technical school taking photography. So when I came here, I started looking for photography jobs. And amazingly enough, the first job I got was working at the Vancouver Public Library as a photo technician in the historical photograph collection, which was kind of a, a very lucky thing for me because uh, it put me right into the mainstream of uh, what was going on around in Vancouver with photography. And that was partly because uh, the historical photograph collection uh, at the public library was a, was a, a nexus for some local groups that were, wor were working on projects. There was a Freddie Douglas, and he had a group that was called the Leonard Frank Society. And uh, they, they, ran, uh, they ran around taking pictures of Vancouver and, and Freddie was the uh, photographer at the Vancouver Art Gallery, so he was connected in with all of the local art community. And also working in a historical collection. Hope I don't get you too bored here. Working in a historical collection, I uh, got to know the local history really, really fast. I mean, I was a, a newcomer here, but uh, they, Vancouver is a city that started in 1886 and photography started in 1839. And uh, it means that meant that every minute of Vancouver's existence was photographed. So there, uh, you know, they did not every single thing that ever happened here ever got photographed, but there's plenty of photographs going right back to the very beginning of the city. And you could just look at pictures and you could see what had happened here now, and, and being in a collection, you get to you get to see a lot more pictures than the average person would because there's you know thousands and thousands of pictures, and the average person only sees like five or six that are put put in a book. So I got to see thousands and thousands of pictures of Vancouver, and I was put to work on working on a one collection in particular that was they had just acquired which was the Dominion Photo Collection, and which was owned by a guy named Percy Bentley who had run the business since uh, about 1910, 1912, something like that. And uh, he had collected a lot of work of the early Vancouver photographers, glass plates and that kind of thing, and um, had a fantastic collection. And uh, I was the guy that sort of uh, got to go through it and and organize it into the, fold it into the main uh, collection of the public library. And, it, and uh, while I was doing, while I was working there at the library, they had the photographs of a woman whose name was Maddie Gunterman. I'll show you this. And I worked in the archives for uh, up until about, well, I worked in the public library till about 75. I worked for maybe another, almost a year at the, at the uh, Vancouver City Archives. And, uh, but I, uh, archives work, being indoors and, you know, being in, the, in a vault all the time. Kind of, not really, but, you know, you're, you're kind of don't really get to see the outside world too much other than dealing with the public. But uh, there were these photographs in the Vancouver Public Library collection that were taken by a woman named Maddie Gunterman who uh, came from the States in about 1898 and uh, lived up in the Kootenays. And she was a cook in the mining and logging camps and also took photographs with a 5x7 camera. And uh, these were most incredible photographs. They were, it's a personal autobiography, uh, a personal, you know, biographical, uh, photographic biography of her life. 
And uh, anyways, I got really interested in this work, and I got tired of working indoors. And I went out and I started. I decided I would go research the life of this woman. I would write a book about her. Well, that was in that was in uh, you know, say nineteen seventy five. Well, it wasn't until nineteen ninety five, twenty years later, that I finally got a book published, and thus proving how slowly I work. But uh, anyways, I got. I did this book that was called. It's called Flap Jacks and Photographs, and it's the uh, History of Maddie Gunterman, Camp Cook, and Photographer. And it's, it was published in 1995. And uh, some of her photographs, there's a couple that are that are kind of almost ubiquitous. You see them whenever there's British Columbia history shown. There's this one of her, of her like, sitting on the stove. Uh, that one, yeah. Oh, that's a cool one. I've definitely seen that in like other books. She's the one on the, she's the one on the stove, and uh, but I was taken with a five by seven on a glass plate, a negative, and uh, so I researched her life and I I got to meet her family, and who lived up in the Kootenays and um, her grandson uh, provided me with a huge amount of information and even more photographs. And uh, it took me forever to write this book, but it, I, you know, finally came out. And uh, then in around um, 1980... Oh, would you mind holding it up again there? Oh, somebody time? wants to see it again? Someone wants to take a screenshot so they oh, can save it for later. And for those of people listening to this on podcast later, the book is called Flapjacks and Photographs. A History of Maddie Gutterman, Camp Cook, and Photographer by Henry Robdo. <laughs> a little, little side note here. I, I started, uh, so I did the book in 1995. Well, during the pandemic, a lady from England, I think her name was Lynn Cooper. I should remember her name. She wrote me and said, uh, Maddie Gunderman is my uncle's grandfather's second cousin's uh, brother's friend's wife's uh, relative, or something <laughs> like that. You know, that almost sounds like something from Spaceballs when Dark Helmet's like, "I was your father's brother's uncle's oh, yeah. cousin's former yeah. roommate," <laughs> and and she said, and I found out, you know, Maddie Gunterman was my and my family. And I thought I said thank you, and then uh, I kind of let it drop because uh, I, you know, I, I finished the project in 1995 and I started it in 1975, and I just didn't want to go back there. But there was a lot of stuff like I didn't know who Maddie Gunderman's mother was, who her father was. I knew she was a kind of an orphan that was brought up by her grandmother, and uh, I didn't know. Uh, I didn't even know her birthday. I didn't know all kinds of stuff that was really key data to a person's life that I was writing a biography about. Anyways, uh, so then I, during the COVID thing, I looked up the information Lynn Cooper had sent me, and wow, it was incredible. I discovered who her mother and her father were. I discovered uh, all kinds of stuff about her family and it was, I didn't even know she had much of a family. I, I got all this information from her grandson, but I, I guess he must not have known it either. So, I mean, how much do we know about our grandparents? How much do we know about, uh, you know, even our parents? So, um, it was, I, I've, I've delved into this, and I've, it's almost like I have to rewrite the beginning of the book over again because I discovered all this stuff. And then the other thing, too, is she lived in the Arrow Lakes, and uh, she lived there in the, uh, in, the, in the Lardo area of Upper Arrow Lake, and was up in the top of Kootenai Lake. There's a connecting lake in there. That's the Lardo Valley. And, uh, and when you look at the history of British Columbia, you see there's all this, uh, you know, if you look at the coast, all the indigenous people are, are have a really strong presence. 
in, in the history, but in that particular valley in the Arrow Lakes, when I was doing the research on my book, there was no, there were no indigenous people. I thought that was really, really weird. And I would ask all the historical societies and all these people of uh, where, where, where were the indigenous people, and they would say, well, they were maybe some Kootenai Indians lived here or something like that. And uh, well, recently, the the people who are the Sinaiics people who live in uh, now are one of the, the seventeen. Uh, collective nations down that live in Colville, Washington, um, have been reasserting themselves up into the Arrow Lakes along the Columbia River, up into their original territory. And it turns out that Canada prevented them from, once they went down, they, they, they migrated up and down the uh, Columbia River system was their territory. And once they crossed the border back down into the States, Canada didn't allow them to come back in because then they, Canada said, oh, well, you're not Canadian Indians, you're American Indians, so you have to live down there. And didn't they display some of the Duke of Wars too? They did the same stuff. We did this, yeah. Canada did, did things with the Duke of Wars too. Like they took, they didn't want to send their children to school, so they took the children away and stuck them in a, in a camp in, I guess, New Denver, is that where it was? It's Locan. Yeah, I lived in Castlegar for a while and learned yeah. about the whole Duke of War thing. Yeah. It's a bit crazy. Yeah. Anyways, this was right in the Arrow Lakes there, so now I have another thing to add to my read. If I ever do another version of Maddie Gunterman, it'll have to have about the Sinaiics people, too, because uh, that's really important to, uh, you know, I, I discovered this one thing uh, doing some recent research that was in 1896. Uh, the government, the British Columbia legislature, le legislature um, uh, passed uh, an act that, that non-resident Indians can't hunt in the mining country of the Kootenays. That was in 1896. They didn't want to mess, the, the, the miners were pouring in there so heavily. Anyways, uh, this was an incredible project to work on, and I was glad to get it. I, I had to disassociate myself from it quite a few times until I, you know, would write a, a copy, a version of my manuscript and send it off and get rejected, and then I would not work on it for a few years, and then I'd redo it. And then computers came along in 1993, I guess it was, and the internet came along right then too. Um, uh, I, I got myself a page layout program and I made a dummy copy of my book and I sent it out and I got three offers. So that was quite amazing. Jeffrey has a comment here. Every oh, yeah. time that uh, he learns more history about how poorly the uh, indigenous people in Canada were treated, it breaks his heart. And I, I have to agree with him. It's we, We've done a terrible job. Yeah, it was really, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. All right. All right. Henry's grabbing another book here. I guess. I guess we'll just go by the books of my life. <laughs> okay. All right. So, uh, when I was a kid and I was growing up in the states, and we would drive around, there was all this stuff beside the highway that was really interesting stuff. You know, it was mostly uh, like a restaurant with a giant something on it, like a, you know, or, or a fish or a something, a something big. Anyways, uh, I took photographs of these things in the early 1970s, and uh, I was still going down to visit my parents down in California, even though I lived in uh, Canada, and driving up and down between Canada and uh, Southern California. I took pictures, and there was a bunch of giant things, and I started taking pictures of them, and pretty soon I had uh, quite a lot of pictures of giant things. And um, at first, I did a couple of uh, little um, portfolios, uh, like postcards. Here, I'll, I'll show you that, too. I also have to uh, shout out to uh, Take, a.k.a. Big Head Taco. 
um, Take introduced me to Henry and uh, kind of has a part in making this happen because uh, had Take not introduced uh, the two of us, I, I would have never gotten to know Henry and learn about his adventures and uh, be able to share this time with you guys. So if you don't follow him, uh, check him out. It's Big Head Taco on Instagram. I think it's also Big Head Taco on YouTube. I think he's a bit more active on YouTube. So Yeah, he's a fast talker, but he's... He's uh, he's great. I love Take. Yeah, Take is a great guy. So I did this uh, first. I did. Oops, where is it? Okay, I did some postcards, and uh, and I I gave I gave my project a name. It's a bit long. I should have called it something like Big Giant Things. In fact, I did call it Giant <laughs> Things at first, but then I called it. Then I called it the Pan Canadian Gianthropological Survey, and uh, and I did postcards, and uh, I have been driving back and forth between uh, California and Vancouver. But I thought, well, what is what if I go across Canada? What would what would I find? Are there any giant things in Canada? Yeah, well, it turns out there were a few. <laughs> and uh, they, there have gotten to be a lot more. So this would have been in, say, you know, 1981 or so. In fact, I went on my first, I call these things digs, and I went on my first dig in 1981, which was to the North Pole. So we went to the North Pole. It was called the North Pole Dig of the Gianthropological Survey. And let's see if I got one here uh, from the North Pole. Oh, I got some from my first dig. So on my first dig, I got, uh, there was like the giant Sasquatch. Oh, the camera's up there, all right. Yeah, there you go. It's the giant Sasquatch. It's gone now. That was uh, near Williams Lake. The, ter the um, tower thing is still on the side of the highway. The, the Wilderness Fort Museum, yeah, it yeah. fell down. What's really cool is you can look at Google Earth. You can drive along the highway on Google Earth, and you can find this spot, and it's all dilapidated and gone now. Oh, wow. And then we, let's see, what else do I have from that first dig? And then we went up to, uh, we went all the way up to Inuvik. Oh, yeah. And in, in Inuvik was the, uh, the giant igloo church. And uh, it's really interesting to look at this nowadays because this was the church that they sent all the residential school kids to. <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> Takes on a new meaning when you when you uh, describe what Inuvik was all about. There were several residential schools in in Inuvik where the uh, Inuit kids were sent, and some of the northern People, I guess, maybe some Dene people uh, and other people from around the, you know, the uh, Northwest Territories. Anyways, I went on digs and uh, every, just about, about every year starting in 1981, I went on a dig. So in 82, I went to uh, all the way across to as far as Montreal. In 83, we went to Saskatoon. That doesn't sound like much, but... Uh, <laughs> I mean, Saskatoon is very... There's the big goose there. Well, there's... Along the way, there's like the... the I the gooses in Wawa. Sorry. Yeah, gooses in the Wawa. There's dinosaur, an, right? Yeah, there's an egg in Vigerville, which is in Alberta. I haven't seen and, the egg. Uh, anyways, so I did these postcards... This is the first thing I did. There's the giant nickel in Sudbury. And I, I won't show them this way. This is too, too not good. Here, I can grab the other thing and we can use that. All right. Which one do you want to show? There's the giant nickel. The giant nickel in Sudbury. And, oh, there's Mr. PG up in Prince George. 
He sort of looks like a log, but he's not. He's actually made out of a pipe, or he was. And there's a giant head. That was in Revelstoke. That's really old. That was made in the 1920s. Oh, wild. I don't know how culturally acceptable this uh, tomahawk and teepee are, but that's in Cut Knife, Saskatchewan. This is the uh, territory of people like Crowfoot and... Uh, And Poundmaker, Poundmaker was the great peacemaker, really, and uh, so it's kind of, uh, maybe it's derogatory to have a tomahawk for a, in a place where a guy was a peacemaker. This is a really strange one. It's a giant... Uh, is that in northern Ontario? Yeah. It's, it's still there, and it's, it's still there. so creepy. Yeah, they dress him up, and they put bikinis on him and stuff. <laughs> it's the creepiest thing They paint thing him ever. a different color every year. Sometimes he's green, sometimes he's blue. He was black last He's supposed to be a it. Sasquatch. Looks like he's giving a thumbs up there. Yeah, and he used to be next in front of a chip stand, but then they moved him into town, if you can call that a town. I don't know. Yeah, you can call that a town. I shouldn't say such negative things. Smokey the Bear, that's in Revelstoke. I don't know if that's... I, this stuff is from so long ago, I, the 1980s, you know. I don't know if it's even around anymore. Some of it still is. There's a giant thermometer in White River. That's still there. Got to know what the temperature is. Yeah. Oh, I don't know if these are coming through very well. Anyways, anyways I did a set of postcards. And, and, and as the years, so 82, 83, 84, I went on what was called the Big Dig. And I have a website. You can go look, look at my website. And, uh, there's a movie on there that my son Frank did of me on the Big Dig. And uh, went all the way to Newfoundland and back. That was quite, a, quite the deal. And... Uh, it has a pretty cool uh, video. I get, I, in my stories, if you take a look, there's a link to Henry's website. But if not, it's uh, Henry uh, Robodeau dot uh, CA. CA. Yeah, couldn't get any 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 easier than that. And there's a lot of really cool videos on there. Like the Big Dig was a cool one, and I also really like the Eraser Street. Uh, Oh yeah, Racer Street. And there's a my favorite actually is one that's called Boschemann's Waltz, which is like made out of somebody else's home movies from the nineteen fifties. Did you see that one? Yeah, I did. And, but you did the soundtrack. I did too, the right? I, yeah, I yeah. did all the music. I, I'm like a sort of a grade B piano player. So I made up the music for that and everything. And uh So I did this other book. Uh-oh, you start that up. Are you going to start that up? What happens when you start that up? Well, it'll play the audio. They can't see the video, oh. but you can hear a sampling of uh, Henry's well, it's me music talking. Here. It's me talking first. Okay. How far in is the... Just, just play the beginning of it. All right. Here's the beginning of Boschman's Waltz. Can you hear it? Hear anything? Yeah. It's the trees rustling. And then I start playing the accordion. Anshans Beauchemin was born in the Indian summer of 1923 in Nashua, Massachusetts. And he always said those dancing orange maple leaves of autumn were the first thing his baby eyes ever saw. No matter what you asked him, his answer was always, I'm dancing in the maples. Before going off to meet that great guy in the sky, he left a shoebox under his bed. In it were some photographs of his band buddies, a couple of 
eight millimeter movies, some love letters from his girlfriend Suzette, and a beat up old accordion. That's it, his whole life. Uncle Bonchance was famous, he was also a nobody. He went back and forth between fame and obscurity. He was a jalopy car yeah. racer. Michael. Michael's he was a crash up tragic hero of World War II. He was a musician who never got a lucky break. While fame's forgotten, like yesterday's New York Times blowing down Bleecker Street, the one thing he gave us that we'll always remember was he hearing that was dancing in the maples yeah. to Beauchemin's waltz. <laughs> This is somebody else's home movies. Yeah, the, the, the story behind that, it's a very complicated story, but uh, m my mother, uh, my grandmother had uh, 10 kids, and she died giving birth to the 10th. My mother was the oldest of the family, and um, my mother was given the responsibility of bringing up the whole family. And one of her, her youngest brother, was uh, by the time my mother was, you know, married and was still had her youngest brother living there, and he was a juvenile delinquent, and he uh, he loved cars, and he fixed people's cars. So this middle of the depression, and he would see pe car, a car that he liked, and he would hot wire it, and he would then drive it around. So one time he heard that, and there was a actor, Errol Flynn, Errol Flynn, and he had a 12, or maybe it was a 16-cylinder Cadillac. It was the most incredible car ever made. Uh, maybe it was a 12-cylinder Cadillac. And he had, there was only one of them made, and it was made for Errol Flynn. It was yellow convertible 1936 12-cylinder Cadillac. Well, the mayor, the mayor of Montpelier, Vermont, was so impressed with this car, he had Cadillac make one for him, too. So then there were two of these yellow 12-cylinder uh, Cadillac convertibles, one owned by the mayor of Montpelier, Vermont, and the other one by uh, Errol Flynn. And my uncle, who was maybe 15 years old, thought, oh yeah, Montpelier, that's pretty close. To, he lived in Lemonster, Massachusetts. So he went up to Montpelier and found the car and he stole it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, back then it was pretty easy to steal cars, so. <laughs> but he drove it all the way down to Massachusetts, which made it a federal crime because oh, if he, you, crossed state borders. he crossed the state border in the commission of a, and it was Grand Theft Auto. So it was, you know, they have a video game that's called that. Now they should have my <laughs> uncle be in it. They should have the car in it. Yeah. And uh, and the car, the car, you should go look at it. You can look it up on the internet, you know, like the, it's like a 1936 yellow Cadillac. And the thing, the way you find it, it's got like a 12, or maybe it's a 16 cylinder engine. It's had, had more cylinders. You could, uh, it just, they, it used up gas so fast that you had to have a, the tanker truck follow you around <laughs> to drive it. <laughs> that was back in the day. Anyways, like. anyways, I started. He also later on, he when he grew up, he played the accordion and he and he tried to make a living doing that. He he was uh, 
he rode, uh, drove jalopy cars and races and I know you guys are wondering what the hell this has to do with photography, but it's what got me started on doing that movie about Bonne Chance Beauchemin. Because uh, in French that means uh, good luck, uh, uh, good luck, good highway, eh? Beauchemin. <laughs> and, uh, okay, that, that was my website. Anyways, I, was, I don't know, how, how do we get on that? I'm really so, I can get so on a sidetrack here so easily. Okay, so then I did this book, uh, Canada's Gigantic. Uh, by, by, not, by the mid-1980s, I had gone back and forth across Canada quite a few times working on this project, meeting people, and, and then in 1987, we moved to Montreal. <clears throat> and, uh, and the second, and, and I got a job teaching. Oh, by the way, I had started teaching I kind of missed that whole chunk there. Uh, in 1979, I started teaching at the Vancouver School of Art that was transitioning into Emily Carr and moved to Granville Island in 1980. And I was, I, I was somebody, uh, the guy, Jim Brookelman, who was the head of, started the photography program, um, went on a sabbatical and, they, and he recommended me to take his place while he was out of, uh, out of, the, out on his sabbatical. And so I came in off the street, and I went from off the street to head of the part, the head of the department until the next year I was out on the street again when he came back. And, uh, but I started, that when I started teaching, and I taught at Emily Carr up until 2015. I also taught at Concordia, a uh, little bit UVic, uh, one course, Simon Fraser, uh, well, UBC. A, there was another great video on your and website. Saskatchewan. <clears throat> there's another great video on your website that I enjoyed from your um, Emily Carr days when you got Robert Frank oh, yeah. to come um, see your class. Yeah. And th that video is great, but um, I, I like the story of how you got him to actually come out. <laughs> and he thought it was an all-girls school. No, he didn't really. <laughs> no, he didn't really. Okay, he was just joking around. Yeah, he was joking around. The only, <laughs> I, you know, uh, that was probably a really important thing for me in my life was to meet Robert Frank, because uh, I never I, I I was teaching in the art school, but I'd never had gone to art school myself. In fact, I only have a high only had a high school diploma. And it was only because I was uh, so involved with photography that uh, I, just, I just, you know, from technical stuff to research on historical stuff to uh, doing my own work, um, I just knew a lot about photography. So I was probably not too bad of a guy for teaching. And, um, and, and my students asked me, they said, you know, we got some money to invite guest artists. So they said... I said, who do you want to invite? And they said, they said, how about like Ansel Adams and uh, Danny Lyons? And I wrote people letters. And I wrote one to Robert Frank. They wanted Robert Frank too. And nobody else, nobody answered my letters except for Robert Frank. That's what my, you'll see if you watch that video, you'll see that. And, uh, and he came out here. And I was, we were friends for a few years. Uh, I was, um, that could bring me to another moment here, but uh, I got uh, uh, sort of via the Robert Frank thread. I got to be friends with uh, Chester Pelkey, who was in lived in Saskatoon. And uh, and Chester was a writer called him called himself uh, Edward Morose, and um, he wrote uh, of abstract, really kind of strange, eerie tales, and not, you know fictional, psychological. I don't know what Chester would want to. I mean, I'm probably not giving him the right credit for the kind of writing that he did. 
some people just thought he was crazy, but uh, but anyway, it's good to be friends and 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 went out to Saskatoon. I taught at the university for three years uh, when Chester's wife uh, um, Brenda was working uh, was teaching at the university and got me to do summer sessions there. So I taught at the university in Saskatoon. And uh, but Chester had gone on a on a trip with Robert, and they had gone with a guy, Charlie Murphy, who's from uh, Mabu, Nova Scotia, and uh, Chester, and Chester's brother-in-law, Brenda's brother. They, they went with Robert from uh, up, up the train line to uh, Puckatawagan. And, uh, and this is a real Robert Frank kind of thing. I, Robert never did a book or a picture or a story on it, but uh, but it was a really eye-opening moment for uh, for Robert Frank, you know, because he's so involved in the art community, especially you know, like New York, like it's kind of really kind of a crazy place. He'd come up to he had a place in Mabu, that's where he met, uh, that's where Charlie Murphy lived, and uh, he was friends with Charlie. And they all went up into uh, up into Puckatawagan, and this was kind of a a shared experience that was just between Robert and Chester and Charlie and uh, Brenda's brother, and it doesn't really exist anywhere in art history, although it, it probably should, because <laughs> uh, Charlie. Charlie Murphy was teaching on the on the reserve there, and uh, they stayed in his trailer. And at night, they were, they uh, were went outside the trailer to uh, like go pee in the woods or something. And they saw all this light coming out these holes in the trailer, and it's and it, it was where people had shot at the trailer, and there were bullet holes in the trailer. <laughs> <laughs> that was the trailer they were staying. That's at. where the teacher stayed in the, uh, <laughs> at in Puckatawagan. I guess some people didn't like their grades. Yeah, and uh, and to get there, you go on a train up to Puckatawagan, and the the track is not built on a roadbed; it's just put right on the muskeg. So in the summertime, when the train goes up there, it it sinks into the muskeg. I don't even know if that line is still there anyways. So Chest, so I had met Robert Frank uh, in 1980, and, uh, and Chester got to meet him a few years later, and, um, and Chester began phoning. He, he phoned Robert incessantly, and they got to be good phone buddies, and Robert... Uh, Chester always phoned like you at two o'clock in the morning. That's an interesting time to call. Yeah, it's like he. Anyways, so I got to be friends with Chester, and and we every year we did a Charlie and Chester, and I sent Robert a birthday card on his birthday, so November 9th. But uh, anyways, so um, I did this book called Big Stories, and uh, I did this, I, did I, I didn't really talk about the Giant Things book, did I? I no. I kind of skipped over that. You can oh, jump well. back to it. It kind of wrecks the flow of my story. Okay, we'll jump back. <laughs> How much time do we have left? As much time as well, you want How much time have we used? Uh, 44 minutes. All right. But... It's, it's up I'm to notorious. You. I'm notorious for never shutting up. Okay, so I did this book. In 1987, we moved to Montreal. And uh, by 1987, I had created, I had, had a, I maybe had 25 or 30 shows around Canada of my giant things. And you can see behind my head here, there's this panorama. Like there's the Igloo Church, and uh, and these are the first panoramas that I did. 
anyways, I went, I did those panoramas, and by 1987, I had, uh, I had like a, 60 or, oh, I think I had about 75 of them. And they were all framed up in gigantic frames with plexiglass and everything. Cost me a thousand bucks each to do them. And and uh, I was doing a lot of the work myself. But anyways, uh, we moved to Montreal. And the second day we were in Montreal, there was a flood and all my work was destroyed in the flood. So I had about... Oh, from 1981 to 1987's work, destroyed in a flood. And um, one reason we had gone to Montreal is I was going to do a book of my panoramas, and it was going to be published by, uh, by Summerhill Books in Toronto. And um, so it was kind of, kind of a bad thing. I... The second day I got there, all my stuff that was going to be what I was going to be doing, the whole reason I had gone there was all destroyed. So uh, I got my publisher, was fantastic, fantastic guy, Gordon Mantador. And uh, it came up to Montreal and with a guy, another guy, Peter Day. And Peter Day had been working on Expo 86 and he had been an uh, art consultant and been... Uh, working with placing art around Expo 86, and now it was 1987, and he was, they were gonna, they were gonna do this uh, panorama book, but then it, my panoramas were destroyed, and uh, they said, oh well, okay, we'll don't, we won't do panoramas, we'll just do the individual pictures, so that's what this book is. This came, this came out in 88, and it's, uh, so it's individual pictures of the stuff. Uh, there's some giant cow heads in Winnipeg. And, um, and instead of doing the panoramas, they did just individual pictures. And it, was, it sold for 10 bucks. This book sold for 10 bucks. There's like 100 different giant things in here. It's a cool looking book. There's, uh, here's some giant insects on a house in Quebec. It's all shot with a Leica. It's my... Is it an M4? Or? Yeah, it was an M6. I think. Oh, nice. Oh, it, actually, no, I think it was an M6. What happened, that's the other thing that happened. We moved to Montreal. There's a flood happened. Uh, uh, the second day we were there, about a month later, somebody kicked in the kicked in the back door of our apartment and stole my Leica. So got a, and because I was teaching, I had insurance at the, through the university, and uh, they replaced my Leica. And the guy that replaced it said, "We pay more for your for that camera than we pay for most cars that get stolen." <laughs> <laughs> and that was a long time ago. They were only I think they were. Still in the hundreds of dollars instead of thousands of dollars. Although I'm not, I don't know. Anyways, so this came out in 1987. Canada's gigantic. It's actually called Pacific to Atlantic. Canada's gigantic. Bob Crumbauer says hello to you. Bob. Oh, yeah. He He's the guy from in. Awesome Vancouver. Yeah, Vancouver's awesome. He's yeah. also a, uh, a studio mate of mine at the City Centre Motel. Oh, oh right. It's funny you ended up in a motel. <laughs> a very story it's motel, funny. too. Yeah, you guys ended up in a motel. <laughs> and, uh, well, he knows about my Maddie Gunterman thing. He did, he did a, an episode on Maddie Gunterman. That's right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I, I have to tell you a little anecdote here. When this book came out... Canada's Gigantic. Canada's Gigantic. I... Uh, my publisher had me come to the Toronto uh, Book Fair, and the guest of honor was Margaret Atwood. And the, my publisher, he got me at the Canada table, and I was the author to sign my books after Mar Margaret Atwood signed her books. And, uh, and so I got there to do my session, 
And I get there, and there's a line out the door, down the street, around the block, of people holding their Margaret Atwood books, ready to have them signed. And uh, so then uh, the time comes, and it's my turn, and I, she takes her books away, and she disappears, and all of the people that were disappointed, they, they left. And I sat there with my little pile of books, with my giant things book sitting there, and maybe one or two or three people came by during my hour. It was it was quite good, but I got a good picture <laughs> of. Bob says thank you and sorry they should have featured you more in the piece. Oh, so I teased him saying that they should do a feature on you. All <laughs> right, <laughs> I did get this one picture. Uh, it's hard. It's a bit fuzzy, but. It's uh, Margaret Atwood sitting at the table there. And she's signing her books. And the book she was signing was Cat's Eye. And she's talking with a guy named David McFadden. It was really interesting being there with a picture book and being with all these the literati people because, you know, I, I, I think maybe when I first started out when I first left home, I think I, I wanted to be a writer. It's kind of weird, eh? And uh, I was never, I never thought I was very good at it, very good at writing. So I never really, I would write stuff down, but uh, I wasn't like a writerly person. Now in my old age, that's all I do. I write all the time now. And, uh, and photography is starting to slip away because of that. Which isn't, uh, I really miss, I really miss doing as much photography as I did the rest of my life. But uh, I've been writing stuff down just because I'm such a blabbermouth and, uh, and my stories, you know, I want, uh, I just want to get them down on paper. And uh, so I don't know if I'll, if I'll ever make it into the, into the world of the literati, but uh at least I, you know, writing them down. I think that's probably an important thing. Absolutely. Okay, well, so in 1990, we moved back to Vancouver. I think I've almost gone an hour now. Just in, in 1990, we moved back to Vancouver, or I did. Jeannie stayed in Montreal for till 1991. Uh, I got a job. I was working out here with my friend Robert Kiesier, Robert was the Greenpeace photographer, was the first Greenpeace photographer and did the, that uh, Amchitka voyage uh, that was the, the, the uh, founding of Greenpeace. And uh, I worked with Robert from 1990 up until maybe, I don't know, 2005. We worked together. Uh, I was his assistant, really, truthfully. I wouldn't, you know, when I say we worked together, but it was, you know, it was his gig. I was the, I was the helper guy. And um, we ended up photographing. We became the principal photographers here in Vancouver for Rodney Graham and uh, um, Robert photographed many, many important artists, and I had access to people via him, and then I kind of carried on it with it in my own vein later on as I, uh, as my own photography uh, I, I was harder to deal with than just doing photography for other people. So I worked for like uh, a lot of indigenous artists, uh, you know, George Little Child, and, uh, and I worked with... Uh, Adrian Stimson and Lori Blondeau and uh, Rebecca Belmore and Dana Claxton. And uh, so uh, I kind of ended up doing that. But back in the, back in the days when I was doing all of everything else and I had a lot of other photography d going, I, did, I made these series and then I called them The Ironic Tragedy of Human Existence. And they were narratives. And that's what this book... Uh, Big Stories is. And uh, 
and I made, did this book with Edward Morose. That's what it says. Uh, an essay by Edward Morose, but his real name was Chester Pelkey. And um, he had a, a horrible disease that's uh, called ankylosing spondylitis. And uh, it misshapes your body and it, uh, it's an autoimmune disease and, and it kills you. And uh, he died in 2012. He died, it was so bizarre. It was 2012, and I had just inherited an alligator farm in Florida. And I was down there. <laughs> what? <laughs> I, was, I was down there in Florida looking, out, looking at the alligator farm. And, uh, you know, they're saying, that, like, you got to wear boots if you're here because you might get bit by a moccasin snake that are poisonous because it was in a swamp it was in the Wutlahoochee swamp and uh and i get a phone call and it's chester's daughter telling me that chester has died and it was so bizarre it was typical of everything that i did with chester and uh, anyways we did this book big stories and it's my narratives and these are uh, I did one that's called, um, uh, the first one I did is called The Crossroads of Life, and, and it's multiple images, and there's text. They, they look, it's really hard to see this, but uh, was the... Are you trying to show the image? I'm trying to show the image, yeah. Yeah. What's, what are the, because it looks like it's six, four images? Yeah, it's basically the, these, the first one I did was uh, four images per frame, and there's five frames, and they're uh, basically uh, have my rambling writing, but it's, it's sort of uh, like armchair, but philosoph philosophical, you know, not nothing profound, uh, but you know, it's pretty direct uh, to what goes on in life and how you can survive it or not. And uh, so that's what that's that's why it's called the ironic tragedy of human existence. And uh, and I like that title. Yeah. So, hey, Merlin, you this is your show. You haven't said anything. Well. It's my show, but it's also to facilitate photographers to be able to talk about their stories. And uh, you know, the thing with you, you have very fantastical stories. And yeah. uh, you, know, you also have had the opportunity to meet many photographers. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it would be, behoove me to not mention how Take got to know you. Oh, God. And so <laughs> why Take knows Henry and why I get to know Henry now is because uh, Take uh, was a huge fan of Fred Herzog. Yeah, Fred. Who yeah. Uh, would regularly do photo walks in Strathcona. And uh, one time Take was driving with his wife and uh, was like, oh, my God, that's Fred Herzog. And she's like, pull over and say hi to him. He's like, no, I don't want to be a fanboy. And she's like, no, just like pull over and say hi to him. And... Uh, so he pulled over and walked up to you guys, and you recognized him from his YouTube, yeah. which I think gave him some credibility there. I said, "You're the guy on the you're the guy on the internet." Yeah, <laughs> and there you are. You're like right here with us, just like your real guy, with his real wife. Yeah, and uh, and and I could, I have to tell it from Fred Herzog's side too, because <laughs> we're walking along, we're just taking pictures of Strathcona, and there's a. And then Take's up there, he just pulls up or something, and he's there in his car. And Fred's going, who's that guy? Who's that guy? And I say, oh, that looks like the guy from the internet, you know? And, uh, and, and, and so Fred uh, really, really liked people to, like, recognize him. So, so I re right away I had to say to uh, when, you know, I had to draw us together. I said, Taki, you're the guy from the internet. And this is Fred Herzog. And he said, and Taki's saying, oh, yeah, you're Fred Herzog. And then they got going. <laughs> and uh, even, even later on, I think we, Taki came to, we used to like go on walks and then go for a lunch. And Taki came for a lunch 
just before, uh, maybe, it was a few months before Fred died. And um, so it was really so, so weird. So I think some things are so weird, like Fred Herzog and Robert Frank died on the same day. Holy shit, really? Yeah, they both died on exactly the same day. Wow. My two buddies, my two photo buddies died on the same day. So, are you saying stuff? Yeah, Tim uh, Tim Ryugo, who is like the real MVP and greatest of all time from Kodak, uh, huh. was just saying, uh, take care and have a great evening. He appreciated your stories. Yeah. Tim's a you're, great guy. You're, you're lucky to bail now, Tim. <laughs> I tried to, okay, I think. Do you want to show some of the Japan pictures? Or no. was there? Um... I, I, that's a big disappointment because I was, I got, you got, for, you asked me the wrong question. You asked me, tell, first tell me something about yourself. But that's important. That's, you know, what the photography okay. chat is well, about. Is let's, to uh, people. let's make this an hour, close to an hour. And just, I'll just show you the other, a couple of other books that I did. And maybe we'll just be talking about the books. Well, here, I'll do this then. Because we don't need this guy if we're just doing oh. books. So oh, okay. Let me... So I'm going to change our visuals? Uh, it will just make it bigger so you have more room. Oh, to show the books. Oh. All right. Uh, I've worked with, uh, mostly s since about working with Robert Kiesier, starting around 1990, uh, I mostly worked with, uh, professionally, with other artists and uh, on art projects. And uh, like, doing production work, really, for, for other people. And, um, but I did some work with uh, Michael Morris and Vincent Trasov. Uh, those of you who are, can remember back that far, uh, Vincent uh, ran as the mayor of Vancouver as Mr. Peanut. And I think that was, <laughs> had to have been in the 60s, I guess. I can't remember which year that was, but uh, anyways, uh, Vincent and Michael uh, are, are artists, and they did a lot of, they had something um, called Image Bank, and uh, and they did correspondence art and uh, mod contemporary uh, work, correspondence art, and they had a, and they had a place up the coast near Seashelt uh, that was uh, at Roberts Creek that was called Babyland. <clears throat> and uh, this was back in the 1970s. They did lots of projects there with a lot of artists who would come in and do projects at Babyland. And uh, in about 20, maybe it was 2008 or so, yeah, 2008, uh, they uh, Babyland had slid into kind of uh, it hadn't been used because Michael and Vincent had gone off to Berlin and uh, Vincent came there in the summers for, for a bit of solitude and uh, but they still had Babyland and they said what, they wanted me to come photograph it for them and uh, before it was completely gone back into the bushes. And so I did this, I did a book for them that's called Babyland. And uh, they did this thing, stuff that was called color research, and they made color bars, and they did, uh, they did color dots, and they, they did art uh, performances with it, and, um, and, I went up there and I photographed them and the buildings that were there. This is them at their little building. There used to be a gallery in Toronto called the Black Cat. Oh, yeah. That yeah. had like a logo like that. Yeah, it's a cigarette. Yeah. There were cigarettes that were back in the 1940s. Huh. 
That's cool. And I photographed them and all the buildings that were around there. And it's a black and white book, but I did the, uh, wherever any of the color stuff was, I did it in color. Here's a bench with some uh, uh, colored dots on it. Anyways, that's, that was an art project that I did with them. And we even made a set of dots that, are, that you can, um, they come in a box that comes with a book and the set of dots, and there you can set them up. There's uh, there's one that's black, one that's white, one that's gray, one that's blue, one that's green, one that's red. So we got RGB and and uh, Mark was saying here that Thrift Books has gigantic and flapjacks. Oh yeah, and photographs available. So. Yeah, those, those are yeah you can get them used pretty cheap. You're not like you know. An original copy of The Americans by Robert Frank costs you <laughs> three and a half million dollars. That's one thing that I always like whenever I come to visit is your photo book collection is phenomenal. Yeah. Here's here's the last most recent book I did, which is called Eraser Street. So I live off of Fraser Street and I went over there on New Year's morning one recent year and I took a little uh put my finger up there like I'm holding a piece of paper and then I went back and I put that in in the dark room. But uh, <clears throat> so it made it into Eraser Street and it's about real estate development in Vancouver. And ever since I came to Vancouver in 1970, well, since the day Vancouver started, it's been real estate developers who run the show here. You know, it's all about... And I've got my, my, my movie on there, which is called the Eraser Street Tour, which is... Uh, There's you with your Leica. Oh, I got my Leica, yeah. Leica's a good camera. <laughs> They're great cameras. <laughs> uh, they take fantastic pictures. Anyways, this book has got... And this is a show that I had at the... <clears throat> it's a show that I had at the Grunt Gallery... In 2015, this was, 2015 was an interesting year for me. I had uh, I worked really hard, and I got this show together for the Grunt, and uh, which was in the springtime, and then uh, in the summertime, I I was uh, diagnosed with lymphoma, and uh, and they you know said well you know you got maybe four months if you you're lucky and but you could have chemo so I had chemo and I got cured but that took up 2015 was pretty much me having a show at the beginning of the year and the rest of the year I was like on chemo and lost my hair and stuff but I'm still here no it didn't didn't completely grow back (laughs) I'm still here and uh, so uh, that kind of, and that's when I stopped teaching as well. I, I stopped teaching in 2015. I had to show I had cancer. So since 2016, I've been uh, sort of just free range. I don't. Oh, I did. I did. A, I did a really a lot of photography for Rebecca Belmore and uh, and Dana Claxton, and oh, fantastic. Working, uh, uh, work. Dana had a show at the VAG maybe two years ago now. Maybe it was just right at the beginning of the COVID stuff. And uh, fantastic photograph. She actually has the cover of Ciel Variab, the, the magazine that comes out of, out of, from Quebec. Oh, yeah, you showed me that. It's a, she has the cover of the most recent issue that's... I think it's coming out. It's, I haven't got a copy of it yet, but it's supposed to be out very, very soon. And for people not uh, local to Vancouver, um, the VAG is um, the Vancouver Art Gallery, which is uh, downtown in, was it the old courthouse or something? Yeah. 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 Okay, folks, I'm going to say salut. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And thank you so much, Henry, for sharing your fantastical stories. We might have to do another episode so you can yeah. share more. Some, sometime later. 
Um, next week, I'm going to have uh, Mel, a.k.a. Luna Moth Photos, joining uh, out of Toronto. So, um, yeah, definitely tune in. Thanks for hanging out with us, and stay safe. I'm going to let Mr. Mocha walk us out here, and uh, we'll see you all next week. so much again Andrew okay a lot of fun it's weird not being able to know like you know I'm like talking to a box here yeah it's the future it's actually okay that I showed my books I mean it's something that people actually could my Japan photographs what could they do with that what could they do with that they could like you know <laughs>